some about purpose, and I do want to share about hydrating humanity, and so we'll kind of try and tie both of those together here. But you know that God lives inside of you? It's pretty amazing. Do you sit around and think about that sometimes? Just, it's a great thing to do, by the way, just to go, even if you're by yourself in your bedroom or whatever, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same one, lives inside of me. So that should change something, actually. When you look in the mirror in the morning, most of you probably look in the mirror, at least a short glance. Some people spend a lot of time looking in the mirror before they leave the house. You know, that would be a great opportunity to look at yourself and regardless of how you feel or how busy the day, to go, he's in me. He's right behind those eyes. He's in me. Who knows what's going to happen today? I mean, with that type of a mindset, which is the one we're supposed to have, 1 Corinthians 6 talks about it, Romans 8 talks about it, Colossians 1 talks about it, he lives inside of you. So nothing is impossible. Nothing is too difficult, right? God lives inside of us. It's something I need to remind myself of often because this life is not easy. And so many things come at us all the time. But if we can remember that, he lives inside of me. And he's got things for me to do. We get to be alive. Not everyone's alive and not everyone's got to live very long, but we are alive right now. And so those kind of things I think about a lot, honestly. And you realize, sadly, that right now, for the first time in over 100 years, about 105 years or so, that the life expectancy in the United States is declining. Did you know that? First time in over a hundred years that life expectancy is declining in the United States with all of our technology, medical breakthroughs, all the advancements. We're in the richest nation that's ever been in existence on the planet. And our life expectancy is going the other way. Part of that reason, well, the reason, and we'll explain a little bit attached to that, is suicide and drug overdoses. That's what's causing, in 100 and some years ago, it was war and pandemics that was keeping life expectancy down. Now it is suicide. People taking their own lives and people overdosing with drugs. Now there are a myriad of reasons why people take their own lives and why there are drug overdoses, but I'm gonna say there's at least a part to play in here of people not knowing what their purpose on this planet is. I know that's not the whole reason, but it is, it's an element of it. It's a part of it. Every person, you and I, need to know why we're here. Why we're here and what we're here for and what has God got for me to do? Because without purpose, boy, it's hard to have hope. Without purpose, it's hard to have vision to move forward. It's, without purpose, it's hard to get out of bed. You and I need to know what our purpose is. Our churches, my church, this church, we need to know what our purpose is for our, our fellowship, our churches, for our city. What did God put me here for? The late Dr. Miles Monroe said this, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but life without purpose. That's a tragedy to live your whole life breathing this miracle of who you are with God on the inside, but not know why am I here? See, and without purpose, there's another thing that happens I've noticed is that I live for myself. It's just a self-based, sucking the life out of everything type of existence. Just a using type thing. But with purpose, ends up doing the other way around. You end up giving. You end up being like God, which he made us in his image. So we're to be givers all the time. It's part of who we are because it's who he is. He's the great giver of all time. Proverbs 16, four says, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose. He's made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. I don't understand that one, but it's what it says. He's made everything for its own purpose. Every single thing that he made, whether it's a tree or a person, has purpose attached to it. That God put in the DNA in there, there's purpose. In Proverbs 29, 19, 
It says that where there's no vision, the people live unrestrained. So without purpose or vision, their restraints fall off. We can see a lot of that in our culture right now. Restraints fall off if you don't know where you're going or what God has for us. So everything is great purpose, especially you. How about Jesus? When um, he came, he knew his purpose, didn't he? That's why he could lay his life down. In Hebrews 12, it says, the author, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he was looking ahead at this, really, maybe the day that we're in right now, he was looking ahead at people who were purchased, set free whole, and that purpose helped him focus. Despising the shame, he sat down, he endured the cross, despised the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, also says this in John, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, what? To destroy the works of the evil one. Part of the purpose of Jesus was to destroy stuff. The works of the devil. Everything that had been accumulated all the way from from the garden that the devil had been involved with, Jesus came to destroy that kind of stuff. I love that. Jesus had great purpose. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 says, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Man, those things are, that's a weighty thing. I think about that. Um, I don't know if you do this when you read the scripture. I, I try to put myself in there. I try to... Make it personal. What is God saying to me right here? He was talking to the Thessalonians right there. What's he saying to me right there? How am I walking worthy of my calling today? How am I leveraging what I have for a higher purpose, for, for the Lord? Because it's about him, really. Isn't that true? This life really is not about us. It's about him. And it's about the purpose that he made me for. I was thinking yesterday for the first time I had this thought that I didn't deserve my parents. Let me just hang with me for a second. They deserved me. In other words, I didn't do anything to deserve the great parents I got. But they worked hard and they planned this family and they got me. Some good and some bad and some ugly. Ugly. But I didn't deserve it. I just grew up in this amazing home. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a home with a, a mom and a dad that loved me. I didn't deserve that, but they worked hard. They wanted me. I see these guys holding the, this baby. They wanted her badly. And she didn't deserve a great set of parents. Here, here we have God who has planned and purposed you. He wants you. He wants you in heart, in mind, in body, so that our whole being is for his good pleasure, it says. That everything that we do would be for his good pleasure. Not my good pleasure, his good pleasure. And then he knows how to take care of me. He knows how to take care of you. He knows how to answer, your, you know, to give you the things that are deep desires on the inside. He can do all that. But if I'm about his business, he can take care of my business. He can take care of what is needed for me. Galatians 2.20, I used to call these vitamins. For I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer Matt who lives. It's Jesus that is alive in me, living in me, living through me, living through you. Just some reminders here on some of this. And then how God, goodness, when he created everything, you realize that God lives out of sight of time. There are a few things that I think about on a daily, well, not every day, but this one I think of often, that are a little bit short-circuiting. I can't think about it too much because it's too big for me and I don't understand it, my brain can't figure it out. And one is the size of God that can hold the universe, as Isaiah 40 says, in the palm of his hand, basically in nine inches, to us, to him, the universe fits there, that we can't even see the edge of yet. It's huge, yet he lives inside of you and me. 
Those things are huge. He's outside of time. So time has no constraint on God. He sees the beginning from the end. He is the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. So he's outside of time. So he can see the past at the same moment he can see a thousand years from now. Because he's God. Isn't that incredible? But then when he made the world and he created and he had the idea, let me make man in my own image. They're gonna look like me. They're gonna have some of the abilities that I have. When he decided this, he also planned our lives. He planned the end as he made the beginning. So he knew how everything was going to turn out, right? Off the bat. Nothing was a surprise to him. And so he planned your purpose. Psalm 139, as you know, well-known passage, says that every day of your life was written in a book before you breathed your first breath. Isn't that amazing? Every day that you are living right now and all that you've yet to live have already been written down. There's a book with your name on it, apparently, in the heavenlies, that has all the days that you live and all the things that you do. It's written before you're born. Incredible how God does these things. So God is not only a planner, but there's this just great purpose he wants us to, to find, to follow, to live for. And we are a part of something much larger than ourselves. When you read Hebrews 11, I, I don't have time to read all of this. Hebrews chapter 11, you know the hero, the hall of faith, as it's often described, it talks of Gideon, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. By faith they did this, they defeated armies. Women received back their dead by resurrection. The others were tortured, not accepting the release. They lived all kind of different places in caves and holes in the ground. It says, and all of these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised Because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Apart from us, those who lived in amazing faith would not be made perfect. In other words, our story is a part of their story. Their story is a part of our story. We don't get to where we are right now singing these songs and having these scriptures without a whole lot of people who paid a lot along the way right? Their story is partially fulfilled in your life. Isn't that amazing? So God, he thinks in large ways. And we are a part of a larger story than our, whatever your birthday is, whatever year you were born. You didn't just really start then. You are a culmination of what God has been doing for a long, long time. And so for some of you in here, for some of us, we may be a part of finishing something God started a thousand years ago. Some of you may be starting something that others will finish after you're gone. Some of us will serve along the way and help expand what God has begun 200 years ago. Who knows which part we have to play, but if it's all about him and his purposes, then it doesn't matter. But it's all great. It's all amazing. It's furthering what God has designed and planned. So then it says, the next verse in Hebrews, going to Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, let me read this. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, talking about those who have gone before us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. That, tell you what, that's gonna take you all the way through the end right there. If we fix our eyes on Jesus, you will not go be led astray, you won't be deceived and you'll fulfill your purpose. Isn't that beautiful? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Philippians 2, 13, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You know, when Isaiah, you read Isaiah, I think it's chapter six, 
somehow he was taken up into a heavenly realm and he overhears the Trinity talking, having a conversation. And God says, who will go for us? Who will do this thing? And Isaiah volunteers. He says, send me, I'll go. And he gets a calling from heaven because he overheard a conversation and he jumped in and volunteered. And it became a purpose for his life, part of what he began to do. We have the book of Isaiah, which is incredible. Part of that was him just volunteering, just jumping in based on really an invitation to step into something that God wanted to do. That's beautiful. God did not wake Isaiah up in the night, shake him and said, here's what I want you to do right now, do it. He said it, God's the God of the invitation. He set the stage for him to be invited and to volunteer. I've found that God does that a lot. I've found that God does that a lot. He invites, you find Moses, how'd he get his calling? Well, he's leading sheep this direction. There's a bush that's on fire over there. It's not directly in front of him. God doesn't rattle his cage and say, you've got to deliver these people. No, he invites him. He uses his curiosity. God, this is one of the beautiful ways God speaks, he uses our curiosity to communicate his plans. And it says, Moses said, I must turn aside. He's speaking to himself when you do that. Lead sheep for 40 years in the backside of a desert. You might do that. He says, I must turn aside and see this great sight. Why is this bush burning but it's not being consumed? And God speaks to him and gives him his purpose. A large purpose to deliver three million people from slavery. He uses curiosity. Amazing. Kind of like Isaiah up in heaven. How about Arena Sendler? Anybody know who Arena Sendler is? I know Sharon's going to know me because I talk about her a lot. She's one of my heroes. She's an amazing person. Mike, have you talked about Arena before? Okay. Arena, if you haven't looked her up, you ought to look her up. Arena Sendler, Polish woman. World War II, Hitler comes into Poland, takes over the nation, right? Starts gathering up the Jews, putting them in the Warsaw Ghetto. He would ship them from there to the concentration camps and killing the Jews, right? Arena is not Jewish, she's Polish, and she sees what's going on, and she's guessing these train full of people they're taking off from this ghetto is not going to a good place. She knows this is bad. Here's what she does. She's a social worker. That's her job. She's 26 years old, and she goes, I can't just watch this happen. This is going on in my city. I can't just know this is going on, and pray that I'll be okay, me and my family. She had little kids. Here's what she did. She was a believer. Her dad was a believer and had instilled in her something of when you see something that is not right, you should take action and help people. That was instilled inside of her from her parents. So she gathers some friends that she could trust and quietly, she develops a plan. Here's her plan, to make a fake ID, saying she's a nurse when she's not, to borrow an ambulance, to recruit these other nurses and social workers, friends of hers, and they're gonna go into the ghetto with an ambulance to, under the guise of checking on the Jewish people, make sure they're okay give them shots, things like that. The Germans let her do that. She would go in and here's what she would say when she'd get in there. They're killing you, they're gonna kill you. If you'll give me your children, I'll take them out of here, I'll give them new names and I'll find adoptive families for them and they'll survive. Can you imagine that conversation? She started taking children that they gave her she would smuggle them out in these ambulances in um, sometimes in little coffins, in suitcases, in toolboxes. And she would take one by one by one that did trip after trip. Every week they're going to, to the Warsaw Ghetto and they're talking these people into giving them their children. They get them out. She finds Catholic families that would adopt them. She writes down their real name, gives them a new name, and buries that 
in the yard of her friend's house to hide who the real names of these kids are. Over time, she does this for a while. The Germans catch her, someone ratted on her. They broke her legs. They demanded that she tell them the names of these children so they could track them down and kill the children. She refused. She was tortured severely. At, by the end of the war, she actually got released and she got out. She lived into her 90s. No one ever heard of her. Actually, the year that Al Gore won the Nobel Peace Prize, she was up for nomination. It was between Irina Sendler and Al Gore. Al Gore won. But she, she has a much greater reward than a Nobel Peace Prize. She rescued 2,500 children, which have become over 50,000 Jewish people today. Irina Sendler, 26-year-old mom, seeing something that's not right and saying, I've got to do something. I've got to do something. And it was remarkable. She's amazing how she did that. So how do you find your purpose? How do I find my purpose? How do we find our purpose? I think uh, several things. I, God doesn't use systems a lot. But here are some things I've learned. Bless you. One is to ask him. He loves questions. I think one of the things that Christians um, avoid or forget to do the most is to ask questions of God. I think if you ask, it says, you have not because? You ask not. So we should ask him questions. Lord, what does this mean? Lord, what is my purpose? Just that question right there. What do you want me to do? Reveal to me the purposes that you have for me. Let me find them. And if I'm not smart enough to figure it out, make up for that lack. And do it anyway. I'm asking you to show me what the purpose that you have for me. On this planet, while I'm breathing air, while I've got my heart beating, I don't want to die without fulfilling the purpose that you have for me. Acts chapter 13, verse 36 says that David fulfilled the purposes of God in his generation and then he fell asleep. What if that's our prayer? Lord, I want to fulfill the purposes that you have for me in my generation before I fall asleep. So first, ask God. Secondly, give ourselves a fresh and anew to him. Hebrews talks about that, to offer yourselves a living sacrifice to the Lord. Here I am. I can stand in front of the mirror. I know you live inside of me. Use me. Do whatever you want with me. I'm yours. I think that's something God loves. And then thirdly, Serve and love other people. I think there's something, I think the way, the pathway to finding our purpose is through serving and loving others. It's amazing how this works. If you are looking to help people and serve, whether it's in a church like this one, and you're working with the kids ministry over in the next building, when you are serving and helping and giving of yourself purpose, the doors of purpose open. It's like you find what you are supposed to be doing. And sometimes you find what you're not supposed to be doing too, which is part of finding what you're supposed to be doing. Right? Serve, love other people. God is a giver. It's what he does. He's giving all the time. As we give and serve and get involved and, make it, and go to help, all of a sudden there's the pathways that open and we find ourselves in places that maybe we would never thought we'd ever be. And I'm gonna tell you, that happened to me. So... I'm gonna tell you my story here a little bit. Um, I'll shorten it. I had been in ministry for a while. Well, let me just say this. I've got five children. I've got one wife. I've got, I met the Lord when I was seven, knew the Lord from a young, a young one, and um, was in the government for five and a half years, resigned from there, Moved to Charlotte, that's where I met Mike years and years ago. Mike, how old were you in 1995? <laughs> Ooh. 17, so I met Mike when he was 17. And um, then I, so I went to Morningstar School of Ministry for a couple of years, then I got hired at Morningstar, I was there for a lot of years on staff. Then I planted this church in Winston and in the, in the middle of this we're having all these kids, great things, busy life. And as I was leading the Bible school, actually, in, in Charlotte, planting a church in Winston-Salem, in that moment, I'm having dinner with a friend in Ohio. His name's Tim. 
And we're sitting across the table from one another, and here's what Tim says excitedly to me. Man, I gotta tell you what I'm doing. I said, what? He said, I'm buying slaves. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I'm buying slaves. I said, you gotta explain. He said, and I knew this, he'd grown up on the mission field in Nepal as a missionary kid and left there, pastoring in Ohio, has his church, it's a thriving church. And he said, I couldn't get this people group, these people in Nepal that I knew about growing up, I couldn't get them out of my heart and my head. About 150,000 of them still enslaved. Now this is in 2002. Slavery, actually there's more slaves today than there's ever been, by the way. But this was in 2002, and he said there's a whole people group that's been enslaved for generations. He said, I couldn't get them out of my head and my heart, so I asked God for help and asked for an idea, and he got this idea to buy Nepalese coffee, coffee from Nepal in the green form, ship it to the United States, find a roaster in the United States that would roast it for free because of the cause, start a company, sell the coffee, use the profits from the sale of the coffee to go back to Nepal, where his childhood friend Gopal, is his name, would go to the slave master and start buying people one at a time. So he started doing it. Saw a need, couldn't get out of his heart, decided to take a step forward. So he started buying people. Then he'd share with his church like this. Hey, we, we're gonna make a, a purchase. Who wants to be involved? One little girl says, all I've got is eight bucks. He said, I'll take it. He bought a person for $8. Bought one old man for $8. They would set them free, give them land, give them rice to plant, their freedom, and they would share the gospel. Now, that was a powerful, 90% of them would meet the Lord on the spot. Why are you doing this for us? Well, I was a slave once too, and this man named Jesus came and set me free. And so they give the gospel right there. So these people are getting set free in two different ways. And it's growing uh, over time. The government then can ignore the situation. We'll go through the whole story. They come in and shut down the slavery operations set the rest of them free that they hadn't purchased. 150,000 people set free. Amazing. Through, through one guy's thought, I know about these people. This is bothering me. What can I do? See, the creator of the universe has every creative idea that there is to have. And when we ask him for some of those, he's happy to lend them. And we are called to be creative like he is. I'm not just talking about painting and things like that, though that's part of creativity. But some of it is ideas that come from heaven that we can't come up with ourselves. To be light in the earth and to push the darkness off. Because we were given the earth to take care of. We were given the earth to have dominion, right? And that's our original calling, was to have dominion on the planet, to bring light into it. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He says, actually, that Jesus said, I am the light of the world while I'm in the world. Then he said, Matthew chapter five, you are the light of the world. Do you realize that? Not only is he living inside, you're the light of the world. Without you and I and the rest of the body, there's no light on the planet. We're the ones who are supposed to go in the middle of darkness and shine and change situations. So when I heard my friend Tim share that story, it compelled me. I felt convicted on one hand, inspired on another, and I asked a dangerous question. Here's the dangerous question. God, would you give me a creative idea to help change the world? Would you give, that's just one question. Would you give me a creative idea since you own them all? Would you drop one inside of me? So I prayed that prayer. Nothing happened. A few months later, I was drinking water from one of these. As I'm doing it, it was a Le Bleu bottle, which is bottled over toward Winston. I was, my attention was drawn to it. I didn't understand it, but I knew God was trying to say something to me. I could feel it. I read every letter on that bottle. I actually tried to move to where it was bottled. I was so certain God was saying something, I put my house for sale. 
and tried to move there because I didn't understand the interpretation. But I knew God was trying to say something. Our house didn't sell. Then. And then one day as I asked again, Lord, I know you've said something to me. It was like all of a sudden, whew, interpretation just fell into my spirit. And it was, I knew that there was a waterborne disease crisis in the world. People were dying. I knew a little bit about it. James Robinson had talked about it. That's where I heard about it. And I'd given a little money. And then it was like this thought was bottle water. Bottle water. Sell it. Use the profits from that to go to Africa where water is needed the most. Well, I don't have a business degree. I'm not the sharpest knife in any drawer. I don't have experience in Africa. I went there, I had been there once before. It was a bad experience. Couldn't wait to leave. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know about bottled water. I don't know about drilling. I don't know about any of this stuff. But I felt this is God. I asked for an idea. Here it is. So I spent the next nine months working on a bit of a plan, a concept of how we might do something like this. Um, I had an intern at the time who helped with some of this. And I would, since I was working and planning a church, I had two, two full-time jobs. I would do this between 10 at night and one in the morning for nine months, worked on a concept, a plan. And after that time, I shared it with a person, he said, I think this could work. So shared it with a larger group of people. And um, well, let me say this. Right before that, I went to Africa. Went to Tanzania. I'd never been to Tanzania before. Went with a friend. And at the end of that trip, last day there, nothing has happened to give me any reason that this is where we're supposed to be doing something and I don't understand how this all fits together. Last day I was journaling and I said, Lord, I believe you put this in my heart to help to provide clean water in Africa, but I don't know how to do it. Um, is Tanzania where you want us to work? That was a question as I write this down. And I heard this bell, like a real bell, not internally, a cow bell. And I looked up, I was sitting on a little porch and here are these string of cattle in the first cow had a bell under its neck and this Maasai boy with a stick about 11 years old was driving the cattle with a stick and he sees me and he runs from the cattle and he runs right underneath my balcony and in perfect English he said give me water I about fell off the balcony I said what and he said again in English give me water I asked again and he said it a third time, give me water. I ran in my, ho my room right there and I grabbed pens and pencils, anything I could find. I had bottles of water in there. I, I didn't even think about it. And I <laughs> threw those down to him. And he looked at me like, you don't speak English, you know? <laughs> but I had an answer to prayer right there. Did God want us to do something in Tanzania? Yes. I went home. I shared uh, at another meeting and this guy came up to me at the end I didn't share that story. His name is Dr. Cha-Cha. How'd you like to have that name? Cha-Cha. Dr. Cha-Cha came up to me at the end and he said, Brother Matt, I just heard you share about you want to help with water. It was all conceptual. And he said, uh, I'm from Tanzania. And he said, my sister died of a waterborne disease. My family's still there. I've always had it in my heart to help my home village. Will you come with me? I said, yes, I didn't have a clue what we're gonna do. I mean, not a, not a clue. That same meeting, someone came up to me and wrote me a check for $15,000 for us to start something. That happened, same meeting. So we started. Our first four holes were dry. We didn't know what we were doing. We went to Cha-Cha's village, gave him a little money. He said he could figure it out with some of the local guys. Guess what? The wells were like sideways. One of them was in, dug in a garbage pit. You're not supposed to do that. It was, they were all wrong. But we kept going. Our fifth one, we hit water because we learned from some other people. I need to speed up the story. And we hit water in July of 2005. Our first water source. And man, was it amazing. We went there uh, at a school, the celebration the dancing, the amazing, because 
if you can realize this, that the reality at that moment in time, it's a little bit different now, but the reality at that moment in time is this, three million people a year dying from waterborne disease. Three million, that's like the population of the size of Chicago disappearing right off the planet every single year from waterborne disease. And mostly it's little kids because the water's dirty. And we were dying around the world in here from those kind of things as well. 125 years ago, 150 years ago, we had a president that died of waterborne disease. I think in 1904, somewhere in there. Because we, we didn't understand the pathways of disease. We didn't understand good hygiene. I didn't understand the water needs to be clean when we drink it. So we were in this, the whole world has been in this place at some point. We just happen to be about 100 years ahead right now of places, some places in Africa. And so um, we started to, we learned quickly we needed to provide hygiene as well as water. And since that time in 2005, we just, we've just finished right around our 680th water source. So what that means, yeah, thank you, Lord. We have an amazing... We have an amazing team of Africans. We have 20 Africans that do the, all the work. Uh, we've grown with them over time. They're amazing social workers, water technicians. We have a drill rig now that my, my uncle left an inheritance to hydrating humanity, paid for half the drill rig, $150,000 toward that drill rig. And so we've got, we can go down 600 feet now through solid rock. We do hand dug wells. We do um, spring well cultivation. Uh, my pictures aren't working today, but I'll show you something here in just, just a moment here. We also realized along the way that water, really from the beginning, our idea was that water would be a spearhead into a village, into people's lives, where we could give them clean water first, meet a natural need, deal with the hygiene issues. That increases the health. Clean water and hygiene together increases the health 75% instantly in a village. You should start saving lives instantly. Then we now show the Jesus film. So we show the Jesus film to 20,000 people a year right now. 20,000 people a year. Then we get to sh get, let them have an opportunity to meet the Lord in their churches. And if there aren't churches, we help plant some. Where there are churches, we try and get them connected with other churches in the area. And so at this point, we're giving water for probably, I don't know, somewhere over 300,000 people every single day. So, and the people who are sponsoring these sources, we don't use the water bottling facility. We don't do that anymore. We used to sell water and that didn't work for us as a business model, got us started. But people sponsor them now. That's really how, how it's done. And those who sponsor, you, you know, while you're sleeping, someone's, you know, the, the women, particularly the women, go get water in the morning and the evening when it's cool. And so while you're sleeping, they are lining up, getting buckets of water, carrying it on their head that's clean, and it's honestly changing a lot of lives. Let me tell you a couple of quick stories about it, just because, man, it's incredible what a little can do. And it's incredible how we take so much for granted. I do. We all do. In fact, a quick story. We flew over nine Maasai Tanzanians to the United States. They ministered and sang in my church. And one of them, they'd never, they'd never not only not been on an airplane, they hadn't seen a toilet, a bathroom, running water before. One of them had killed a lion with a spear. I mean, these were people from the bush, and we work in a, out in a remote area. So they came, and one of the, the African ladies was in the bathroom, and one of our ladies was in there and saw her, and she was at the sink with a faucet on, with her head under the faucet, doing, just doing this. Just running that water over her head. And they could not figure out why we had fountains and stuff. That was the most ridiculous thing that they'd ever seen is water like spurting up going nowhere for no use, just for beauty. It just made no sense to them. Um, it was an amazing experience to see them here and for them to say to us, like, you have way too many things. You have way too much stuff. You have so much. What do you do with all this? You know, asking us those kind of questions, a lot of other questions too. But we went to a girls' boarding school. It's one of our first wells that we did, uh, where girls lived there. The water that we were drinking, you honestly, you wouldn't want your animal to lick this water up. You would not want your animal to, to drink this water. 
uh, the, the headmaster, her name was Millicent, took me there and showed it to me. I was like, oh my God. She said, we have cases of typhoid every week. I'm taking girls every single week to the clinic because they have typhoid. And I said, well, it's, it's, it's that. It's, it's this water we've got. So we helped provide a well. And that year after the well was put in, I think they had one case of typhoid the next year from some multiple every week to one year. And she could have gotten that from home, I'm not sure, hopefully. But that, it wiped that out. We were in another village and these two clans within one tribe have been fighting and killing each other on this hill in between their two villages. They just hated each other. And they'd just been going on for decades and decades. And one of our workers said, hey, what if we put a well on the hill where they fight? The place where they are killing each other, what if that's where they go to get water? And what we do when we provide a clean drinking water source is we make the, communi- the, excuse me, the community participate. So they have to bring some sand and gravel. They feed our guys. And so people from both clans are helping do this well. Through the process, they become friends. They end up forgiving one another. The tribal elders, the chiefs, I have a picture of it. The, the, the chiefs forgave one another. They become friends. Now they've got clean water. They asked us, will you give us a church? Because we shared the gospel at the end. So we actually planted, built a church on top of that hill next to the water source. It's, it's absolutely life-changing. Um, and then my, one of my most fa- favorite stories is uh, we were in Tanzania. This will be my last story here. And this, we were in a village that had never, all these places have never had clean drinking water in their history. Think about that. Never had clean drinking water in their history. And we were in this village and we had our machine out with um, these signals, electrical signals going into the ground to try and identify where the water is before we dig. And so our guy is running that and the men in the village are gathered around this machine, just looking at it. I'm standing off to the side, and I see this older man, which I don't see a lot of older people in Africa, at least where we work, life expectancy is not that high, but I see an older man walking toward me. He's looking right at me. He's not looking at all the other guys over here. And he just walks by me, just glares at me. Walks right by me, goes over to that group of guys, starts talking Um, says some stuff loudly, everybody laughs. They all look toward me and start laughing. And uh, it was a little uncomfortable. And then they say something else and they laugh again. Everyone's now looking over at me. And I thought, this is really weird. And it provoked me, not in a Christian way. (laughs) But I'm just gonna tell you what, I did something that I would never tell anybody to do. But I got our translator and I said, I said, what is he saying? And he said, he's making fun of you, sir. (laughs) I said, could you go give him a message for me? And I'm thinking, we're here to help you people. We're here to bring life and clean water. And you're making fun of me. And this provoking came on the inside. I said, would you go to him and ask him a question? Ask him if he knows Jesus. Actually, first say this. You're very old and you'll probably die soon. That's not the best way to start a conversation. But that's actually what I asked him to do. You're very old, you'll probably die soon. Then ask him, do you know Jesus? Now that is not evangelism 101. I don't want anybody to do that. But that it, there is a reality to that. But anyway, so my translator said, are you sure? I said, yes. So he walked over to him, didn't bother this guy at all. He said, you know, you're very old, sir. You'll probably die soon. Do you know Jesus? And he starts talking to this guy and they start walking my way and the crowd of 50 guys. So we all get together here and this guy says, translated to me, no, I don't know Jesus. Um, He had gotten into witchcraft. He was the witch doctor in the village. He was also in charge of the female circumcision, which is, Horrific, like female mutilation is what it really is. He was in charge of that for the area too. He's about this tall. And as he's saying things, he still has this mocking look in his eyes toward me. And I ask another question about uh, him changing. And as he's, he said, I, 
you know, I'm unable. I said, well, you know, this man, Jesus, can change you. He will help you. And he looked at me again, and his, the way he looked at me changed. I didn't understand why. And he said this to me. He said, at first he said, can you, let's step aside where these other guys can't hear. So he steps aside, so it was just three or four of us. And he told me he was the witch doctor. He told me what he had done, some of his stuff. And he said, if I'm going to change, you have to come to my house. I said, okay. My friend Pat Selvey was with me. Pat lives in Moravian Falls here, has a cabin up on the hill. Pat's our international director. He lives in Africa. So Pat and I go to the vehicle. This guy's name is Moita. Moita gets in the vehicle. We drive to his house. Inside of his house is one room. It's just one room, the whole place. It's probably 10 by 10, pitch black. Uh, no lights, just the, when you, the doors open, the only light comes in. It's filthy in there, absolutely filthy. There is crud hanging on the walls, weird looking branches, bottles of oil. Ugh, nasty, nasty. You just don't want to be in there for 10 seconds. And we walk in there and he said, what do you want me to do? I thought, this is so bizarre. We've not shared the gospel other than do you know Jesus and you need him and he can change you. That's about all I said about Jesus. And then he asked me, what do you want me to do? And I thought, this is, I don't know, let me just, let's just go for it here. I said, get everything in this room that's involved with your witchcraft and put it in the middle of the floor. So he starts doing it. He starts pulling things off the walls. He gets all, and so there's a big pile of crud in the middle of the floor. And I'm thinking, this is way too easy. You know, you can argue with someone for an hour and not get anywhere. And here this guy just asked me what he should do, and he's doing it. And as we were there around this crud in the floor, he looks at Pat and I, and he said, you, you've been coming to me in my dreams. And so he said, what dreams? And he said, you, you come to me in my dreams, and you take me, and you put me under the water and you bring me back up again. That's what he said. I can feel it now just like I felt it then. And instantly I knew this is a setup. This is a God setup. I've got nothing to do with this. I just happen to be in the area. God's been giving this man dreams of me and all I had to do was get here. All I had to do was ask God a crazy, dangerous question, and that would lead me on this weird journey and path and four dry holes and all this, and now I'm standing in this village that God has planned for thousands of years, for him to be there and for me to be there. So then I understood it, what was going on. And my translator, Jackson, said, can I share the gospel with him now? I said, yes. So he goes in his language and he shares the gospel and this Moita drops to his knees in his own little room right in front of all his crud and he starts crying. He gets on, puts his arms down, he's on all four and he's repenting and he's giving his life to the Lord. We all drop to our knees with him. We just all, all drop to our knees with him. We surround we start praying for him. We lay our hands on him. We start praying for him. I mean, faith is through the roof. And it is just amazing experience. And I thought, we got to baptize this guy. I mean, this is his dream for one. And this is the next step for another. So we got up and I said, Jackson, where is their water? Well, we're just crossed the border into Tanzania. We haven't provided clean water there yet. And he said, the closest water is back in Kenya. We have to cross the border. I said, well, let's go. So we pile Moita in the vehicle. We go across the border into Kenya, and there's this little creek that is about that deep. Uh, looks like the kind of coffee my dad drinks. Dark with some cream, just dirty looking. And it's about five feet wide. Now, you're, I'm told... I've been told many times, you go to Africa, and which I've been many times, you know, you don't want to have bare feet, barefoot in the soil because there are a lot of different worms that can crawl and bore into your skin, all those kind of things. You don't want to not only drink the water, you don't want to be in the water. But I thought, there's no way I'm not getting wet. There's no way I'm not taking my shoes off. So we go down there with Moita 
to this little creek. And I thought, he's, he doesn't know what baptism, he's seen it in a dream, but he doesn't know anything about it. So I explained what water baptism is and explained a little bit about his dream in that way. Sat him down, because it's not very deep. Now, I've got pictures of it back there too, but he sat down in the water. His toes are sticking though, out of the water. And I never told him to close his mouth. I made a mistake on that one. We, as we're about to baptize him, he says this. He said, this is just like my dream. And then we baptized him. He went under like this. <laughs> One big spit of water out. He stood up. His eyes were clear. He raised his hand and started praising God. True. And here's, here's the truth. I'm telling you, I'm not, an exagger, I'm not prone to exaggeration anyway. But probably 20 to 30 minutes from when I first saw him to that moment. That's how fast this happened. Pull him out of the water. We get wet Moita back in our vehicle, grinning from ear to ear. It's like a different person. His whole face has changed from that mocking face when I first saw him to he's just smiling. And I said, Moita, through the translator, I said, um, how, how long have you been having this dream? I'm just curious. And he, they're not good with time often. He said, many, many, many years. When I first joined the other men with witchcraft, I started having this dream, is what he said. So here's my guess, is that around the time I was born, think about that for a second, maybe around the time I was born, God started giving him a dream of a grown-up me putting him underwater. I said, How, do you have this often? He says, I have it over and over and over. I said, when was the last time you had the dream? He said, last night. Now, is that crazy? That is God. That's just God. And here's the other part. It's me stumbling into a purpose. I like that. No one's smart enough to figure all this stuff out. But what we can do is say, God, what's my purpose? What is it that you put? Give me an idea. Help me serve and you get your feet moving, and then you can stumble right into something that God has set up. I love that God is that way. He is that great and merciful and powerful that he can get you right into all the purposes that he's, he's made for you and written in your book before you're ever born as you simply say, I want it, and I'm gonna help serve. I'm gonna do what I can do where I am. I'm gonna serve. I'm gonna ask for ideas. I'm gonna give of myself. God can do this stuff for us. And every time I go to Africa and I see these kids everywhere, I keep thinking, these could be my kids. This could be me. I just, God chose for me to be born in another country, but he could have chosen me to be born there. These could be my kids. I could have, this is where I could have grown up. We're all one tribe together. We're all one people, all made in the image of God. All the same family, just stretched out everywhere. And we can make a huge difference. Here's another reality I think is incredible that in our generation right now, when I first started this in 2005, there were 1.1, 1.2 billion people that lacked access to clean water. Today it's 680 million. It's been cut in half in the last, since we've been doing this, 14 years. So we've been a small part of a larger effort. So in the next 15 years or so, it could be towards zero. Do you realize that we could knock off the planet waterborne disease? We could just knock it off the planet. I mean, that's a part of the things that we, get, we can be a part of. In addition to the gospel going, the clean, the living water, getting to every single person.